Welcome to tonight's talk. Teresa Gagne is a field naturalist and amateur botanist. Um, and uh, uh, so this, is, this talk is based on a trip we took in 2018 to southeastern France and uh, Spain. And, uh, and Teresa will take it from here. Okay, well, um, as you can see from the title slide, um, the, there were some really wonderful, beautiful flowers. And the reason I'm doing this, I'm doing the speaking, but um, it's really the, the, the uh, presentation is a uh, uh, credit to Denis who took very many of the uh, lovely photos that you'll be seeing tonight. So Denis and I encountered our first orchids wild orchids while cycling the back roads of Brittany in 1978. And uh, we were just so thrilled and excited to see that just along the verges of the road and the little wet meadows um, that there was these orchids growing wild that um, it spurred a, a lifelong interest in orchids as well as in goat cheese, pain au chocolat and good French coffee. So, um, um, 40 years later, in the spring of 2018, we were uh, lucky enough to make a seven week trip to southern France and Spain with a specific goal of seeing spring wildflowers and um, focusing especially on the orchids. So we started our trip in the American tour region of uh, southeastern France along the uh, Italian border. And we were there in mid to late April. And then from there, we went to Southern Spain to the um, Andalusia region in Grazalema and Uetor were the two main parks that we visited there as well as some others. And then from there in the early June, we traveled to the Picos de Europa in Northwestern Spain, um, west of Bilbao. Um, and in all of those areas, we saw um, many beautiful flowers and especially many beautiful orchids. We saw, I think, 46 different species of orchids during uh, a six, seven weeks that we were there. So orchids are, the Orchidaceae are the second largest plant family after the Asteraceae with an estimated 28,000 species. And um, while we maybe, I certainly, um, until I went to Europe, had thought of orchids as pretty much being a tropical thing, um, they are in fact a very um, diverse species. And over the past 80 million years, they've managed to colonize six continents and every conceivable terrestrial habitat remote mountaintops, tropical jungles, and even suburban living rooms. In the tropic, many species are epiphytic, meaning they grow on trees, but all native European orchids are terrestrial perennials with rhizomes or tuberous roots. So you can see some of the cool orchids here, including this duck orchid, which really does kind of look like a flying mallard duck. Some of our BC and Alberta orchids and some from uh, the Southern hemisphere, Brazil and Chile. So um, this talk is gonna be a, mi a mix of kind of botanical information and a little bit of a kind of a travelogue of, of places we, we went. And so uh, to, to give a bit of a background of orchid structure, orchids daisy are a monocot family like the lilies. So their leaves have parallel venation as you can see in this beautiful botanical painting here. And the floral parts are in threes. The word orchid comes from the Greek word orchis, meaning testicle from the appearance of the paired tuberoids that you can see here. The flowers are usually born in spikes or racemes, again, as you'll see here. Um, and the flowers have bilateral symmetry as opposed to the radial symmetry that you see in things like roses and daisies. Um, the flower, the Perianth, which is the name for the botanical name for the sterile part of the flower, is arranged in two whorls. So the outer whorl is three sepals, which you can see here. And the sepals are usually pretty similar. 
in most species of orchids, all three sepals are similar. And the inner whorl, which is the three petals, which are two similar petals, the upper two, which are often curved over to form a hood with the people, and the lower petal, which is forms a lip called the labellum, and that is can be extremely variable in different species of orchids. Um, and here in the photo, you can see <coughs> again the same the structure and um, the different parts of the orchid. The the pollinia is the um, the where the pollen sacs are held, the reproductive part of the orchid. Um, orchid flowers are unique. They're male organs, one or two anthers, fused to the back of the female organ, the pistil, which you, you can't really see back in here, but anyway, that's hidden under, under these um, two petals here that are forming a hood. Both sets of organs work together to transfer pollen to a visiting insect and then collect it again when the insect enters a second flower, encouraging cross-pollination. Insects are attracted to orchids by flower color, shape, scent, including pheromone mimics, or by nectar, which is often secreted in a hollow spur developed at the rear of the labellum. And um, here you can see that this particular um, orchid here has a, a long upward curving spur, sometimes the curves the spur is straight or curving downward, and it's not always that long. Texture is also very important in some orchid genus, especially um, the Ophrys, like this particular one. <coughs> Excuse me. Their labellum are often a mix of hairy, smooth, and shiny velvety textures with complex shapes that may mimic the look and or feel of a female insect. So something that to us might not look much like a bee. It, bees don't use their eyes that much. If it feels like a bee, I guess that's probably good enough for them. Orchid seeds are minute and dust-like and can be dispersed huge distances, but they usually require specialized fungi, mycorrhizae, in the soil for germination and growth of a new plant. So they're not um, that easy to um, reproduce. Uh, most of the species. <clears throat> so as I said, the first part of our trip was in the uh, Parc Mercantour, um, France's newest national park, which was created in 1979. It's located, as you can see, in southeastern France. It's about 685 square kilometers in area, which would make it about a tenth the size of Banff National Park. Stretches north along the Franco-Italian border, where the splendid landscape becomes the Parco delle Alpi Maritimi, which you can see here just outside my pink circle. It includes a central uninhabited zone comprising seven remote valleys in the Alpe Maritime and the Alpe de Haute Provence and a peripheral zone, which includes 28 villages. It's an area of great contrast and an exceptional degree of biodiversity. The elevations in the park range from 500 meters to 3,200 meters with montane valleys and glaciers coexisting with Mediterranean landscapes. The Mercantour has been inhabited for at least 6,000 years and contains, oh, sites, uh, with thousands of examples of prehistoric cave art. It's mammals, um, the transhumance, which is the annual movement of flocks from low pastures to the high mountain pastures, is, uh, has been critical over the thousands of years for preserving the open meadows favored by orchids and other plants in the park. So it's really a case not just of that, it, that it's not that keeping people out uh, preserves the park, the, the, the plants, these plants actually have evolved to be with the grazing flocks to keep the meadows open. So um, the Mercantour also has interesting mammals, including the rare European wolf, as well as chamois, mouflon, ibex, marmots, and wild boar. We did see uh, chamois and mouflon 
and we saw the tracks of a wolf, but no wolves when we were there. Uh, we spent a one week touring in the Mercantour hiking, um, of which five days were spent um, traveling between villages with a donkey to carry our um, baggage. And that was, again, a very interesting experience. So here's a, just some examples of the kind of spectacular scenery and these beautiful open uh, meadows full of flowers. These are, in this case, these are uh, Narcissus in this picture here. And this is our, was our donkey who was appropriately named Lupin, Lup, like a, the flower, the Lupin flower, but was called Lulu. And he was a surprisingly good companion um, most of the time, although he had a great propensity to want to stop and eat everything that we, we passed by. We were told that having, having spent a, the winter in the barn, we were one of the, the, the first trips. And so it was very exciting for him to be out and have the opportunity to taste all these different plants. So he was quite eager to make regular stops every five minutes or so to snack on things. And indeed, could very quickly, if you stopped and weren't paying attention, remove all the leaves from a six foot oak sapling in about three minutes. So um, again, a very beautiful area. You can see in the higher elevations, the snow was just leaving and you can see these early crocuses blooming there at the edge of the snow. And now on to the orchids. So this uh, is a lady, beautiful flower, is a lady orchid in the genus Orcus. The original genus Orcus was evidently a catch-all containing more than 1,300 species, but it's now been pared down to include only 21 species. Um, the, the Orcus orchids often have numerous large and scented flowers which mimic the appearance and scent of typical nectar bearing flowers. But in fact, these orchids offer no nectar at all. So their pollination strategy is food deception, luring a, an insect who thinks it's going to get a food supply. Um, the food deception only works because the orchids have a superior flower display quite early in the year when other flowers are rare. And when we were there, this was um, late April, mid to late April. The newly emerged bees are quite inexperienced and so they're more easily taken in by a flower. And another strategy, the flowers, these orchids often vary the appearance of their flowers, which makes it harder for the insects to learn to avoid them. So these lady orchids were the very first orchids that we saw on our trip and they were the most common and widespread in the American tour at that time. The ones we saw were only about 30 to 40 centimeters tall, but in Southern Italy, its flower spikes are said to reach up to 80 centimeters with up to 200 individual flowers, which would be pretty spectacular. I think this one probably has maybe 30 flowers or something on it. Um, the next, uh, plants are another food deceivers. And um, this is one where you can see, um, I mentioned that burying the, the flower, these, these two flowers, the yellow and this beautiful uh, magenta pink one are both elder flowered orchid, Dactylorhiza sambucina, and it occurs um, mixed together in two, two varieties, the yellow and the pink. And that is, again, presumably part of the strategy to um, keep the insects confused enough to be uh, tricked again and again. Um, and according to um, some things I read, it achieves the best pollination if violets in the same colors are blooming at the same time as the orchids. Um, so this was a, in a high mountain meadow, these beautiful elder flowered orchids and they're a, they have a nice fragrance, uh, but no nectar. So the next is, um, was our first introduction to the um, Ophrys, the, the group of orchids known generally as bee orchids. And the um, Ophrys use a, a, a different deception technique than the uh, previous two orchids. They use sexual deception also called pseudocopulation. 
Um, so the idea is that some of these orchids resemble various insects such as flies or bees and produce scents which resemble those produced by the female insect to attract mates. Um, so the, the, the bee or wasp or fly is attracted to the, to the orchid, grabs onto it thinking that it's a female and in the process um, gets, gets uh, pollen on its head from the uh, pollinia at the top here. The scent produced by the orchid often doesn't match the scent produced by the insect exactly. So like the other orchids, they depend on the availability of newly emerged males um, when the females are not yet present so that um, they're more easily tricked. So this one is an early spider orchid. Um, again, I think that it's one of those things where once they they had the bee orchid and the fly orchid, they just kind of extended the names and there's there's nothing particularly spider-like about the early spider orchid and it isn't attractive to spiders, but it was just kind of continuing on the, the naming theme, I think. Another um, group of, of early flowering orchids um, are the helleborine orchids. And um, they are, are also uh, practicing food deception they have no nectar, but they have on their lips this yellow, which is kind of a fake pollen dust, which attracts um, many insects, collect, as you know, the bees, and they collect pollen um, as a food source. And um, so the, the, or, the insects are attracted to the orchid thinking that it's got pollen, but in fact, this is just a coloring. And speaking of pollen, um, we've all seen things like the anthers of lilies and uh, bees covered with dusty pollen or with pollen sacs. Um, but orchids, as in pollination, do things differently. The single anther that we uh, saw earlier um, forms two stocked or unstocked pollen masses, the pollinia, which have sticky bases and adhere to the bodies of insects in a discrete ball, or in the case of the ones we're seeing here, a, a shape that looks more like a, a club or a, a bowling pin. Um, this uh, means that all of the flower's pollen is removed in one visit, and it's critical that the transported pollinia are attached in a place where they will only contact the pistil of the next flower if it's the same or a closely related species, because otherwise, the, the flower's one chance of pollination is lost because all its pollen is in one package. Around the world, orchid species may be pollinated by seven different families of bees, several families of wasps, nectar drinking flies, butterflies, sphinx and other moths, and even hummingbirds and African sunbirds. European orchids are generally insect pollinated though a few can self-pollinate without any outside help. Some European species are very specialized and are fertilized by just one species of insect. Others are designed to appeal to butterflies, but not to bees or vice versa, while some are visited by various wasps, bees, and or flies. And I think when I look at these, these pictures of these, in this case, um, flies, with the pollinia on them. I often think that it's a, a pretty um, raw deal and rather adding insult to injury that having lured an insect to you um, with the promise of food that, 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 not, that isn't there, that the poor insect then gets to fly around with a bunch of stupid yellow bowling pins stuck to its head or in the case of a moth, as you'll see later, stuck to its tongue. I mean, it really doesn't seem fair. So um, from the Mercantur, we traveled um, south to Spain and into southern Spain to the area known as Andalusia. We visited um, several different areas in Andalusia. Uh, the main place we were in was the Parque Natural de la Sierra de Grazalema here, and also some smaller parks, the Sierra de Huetor, the Sierra Nevada, Sierra de Cazorla, 
and the Cota Donato on the coast, which is a very uh, famous uh, birding area. So uh, the Sierra de Grazalema Natural Park was designated as a UNESCO Biosphere Reserve in 1977 and became the first nat natural park in Andalusia in 1984. It's about 517 kilometers in area, about three quarters of the size of the Park Mercantour. It encompasses several mountain ranges and like the Mercantour, many small municipalities, including a number of Andalusia's famous Pueblos Blancas, which you'll see in the next picture, or white towns. The most fragile ecosystems, about 6% of the park area, are protected as areas de reserve, which are closed in the fire season and require a permit for hiking. Um, the Sierra de Grazalema is one of Spain's most ecologically outstanding areas. Um, spectacularly rugged limestone landscape of cliffs, gullies, caves, and gorges. The region is well known for being the rainiest place in Spain with an annual rainfall of 2,200 millimeters. It includes magnificent and well-preserved forests of the rare Spanish fir, Abies pensapo, which you can see in this uh, lower picture here. Um, and uh, again, this is, this is one of the Pueblos Blanca, the white village of Grazalema, which is where we were based. And from the town, we could just hike from their trails up into the, um, into some of the beautiful, more beautiful areas of the park. Others we did have to drive to. Again, look at the beautiful colors and textures here. It looks like a something laid out in a botanical garden. Um, beautiful rugged limestone area. And we spent um, two weeks in Grazalema. Um, and uh, on part of them, we did a half day tour with a local guide, um, Sue Etock, and who took us specifically to look for um, orchids. What is Sorry, just the problem here. I'm having a problem with the slide advance. No, it's not weird. <laughs> How did we fix that last time? Uh, thank you. There, okay. I think now. Oh, no. Oh, maybe. Okay, there we go. Okay, so here is, um, this is our guide, Sue Etok, and we're out in one of the beautiful meadow areas. This is a, um, an, a cork oak orchard. So these trees are harvested, I think about every seven years or so um, with a layer of their bark, the bark removed for making uh, corks for wine bottles. Um, you can see this is a rainy area. In fact, it had rained that morning and you ski the water on this beautiful iris here. These are our wild gladiolas. And this is a, another, oh, that's a gladiola again there. Um, so, um, and so on our half day tour with Sue, I think we saw 11 or 12 different species of orchid just in that one half day she was really it was really a wonderful um, resource of knowing just the places to take us so this is my favorite bee orchid photo this is actually the bee orchid um, and I call this one the Teletubby orchid because I just think it's so cute with the little shiny black eyes and the big smile and the these little kind of huggable arms I think if it was uh, made up by a uh, in uh, fleece and, and fabric, it would make a great attractive toy for kids. I think it's quite irresistible with its charming smile there. So uh, again, you can see several pictures. You can see quite variable, can be quite a dark pink or a very pale, um, almost white color. Um, has this, this um, hairy uh, body, the, the showy pattern, um, this little green cap with the little doingle that's the, the pollinia there and an interesting thing about the bee orchid is that having evolved all these fantastic sim systems and uh, uh, 
things to, to attract an insect. The bee orchid, in fact, at least in most of Europe and all of Britain, is not pollinated by in, an insect at all. It is, in fact, self-pollinating. Um, Um, so while insects occasionally visit the flowers, they don't seem to be very effective pollinators. So normally after a few days, the pollinia, instead of standing up, fall down like this one, which you can see is kind of like hanging a bit here and um, hang down in front of the stigma. A slight wind swings the pollinia, pollinia against the stigma, which leads to pollination. So it would sort of swing back, stick against this part here and self-pollinate. So kind of interesting to go to all that trouble and then sort of go, oh, well, but then if there's no bees, I can just do without. So next, um, you'll see some other um, species in the, um, the Ophrys, the, the bee orchid group. This is the yellow bee orchid in these two pictures, ranging from lemon yellow to this golden yellow, quite a different looking uh, plant from the previous one. The Algarave bee orchid over here, which has a, a, a very soft, uh, very fine velvet, both the dark and the white. Um, and the showy mirror orchid in the middle here, which has this beautiful, shiny, purple, gold edged patch. And then this very long, um, kind of bristly brown hair and a very, a very elegant uh, shape. So that just gives you some idea of the, the, the bee orchids that we saw in um, Andalusia in southern Spain. <coughs> and as well in the same meadows were um, um, uh, many other orchids. This is a, another orchis like the, 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 um, the lady orchid that we saw, that very first orchid. And like the lady orchid, um, this is a... These are terrestrial orchids that um, have showy flowers that mimic scented flowers that mimic the appearance and scent of typical nectar bearing flowers, but don't offer any nectar. So again, this is a, a, an orchis, or, orchids that practice food deception. So when there were many uh, different uh, species of orchis and anacamptus in uh, around Grazalema. So they included this loose flowered orchid, um, the early purple orchid, uh, again, quite different shape. You see this, this one has these kind of pointy, uh, the, the sepals sticking up as pointy ears. Um, and uh, the, the, the petals curved over and there's quite a broad lip here. Um, some of them had a more of a, a folded lip. This one similar, but with no spots and with the the, the sepals broadly spread instead of um, sticking straight up like horns, um, Lang's orchid. So, and um, then on to um, yet another uh, group of orchids, the Serapias. And these were a very uh, interesting uh, group of orchids. There were our three different ones in the area. We were lucky enough to see two of them. The first one was this, uh, tongue orchid, which you can easily see why it's got its name. And again, you can see that it had rained earlier that day would get everything's be spangled with some um, raindrops. Um, and uh, another um, Serapia that we were uh, lucky to see was the, the heart flowered Serapia. And in some individuals, this um, lower lip is, is quite heart shaped and none of our photos came out quite that heart shape, but still a, a very interesting uh, group of orchids and often in this kind of a rich sort of a coppery um, red color. Um, and um, they are also um, deceivers and cheats. And, um, but in this case there, it's believed that what they offer is habitat mimicry or shelter so that they, they attract the insects as a the as a, a place to spend the night, 
um, and in the process of um, sheltering in the uh, in the flower, they um, pollinate the the orchid. So again, another interesting and bizarre um, pollination strategy. So from um, uh, Andalusia, we um, moved, traveled to uh, northern Spain. This is uh, an area west of Bilbao, close to the coast, and we were in the Parque Nacional de los Picos de, de Europa, the peaks of Europe. And um, the Picos de Europa was first, uh, area was first designated in 1918, one of the first two national parks in Spain. At 646 square kilometers, it's currently a similar size to the Parc Mercantour in France, but it was originally much smaller. Like the Mercantour, it's an area of extreme contrast with elevations ranging from 75 meters in the lowest valleys up to 2,650 meters for its highest peak. It's thought that the name arose because these mountains were the first site of Europe for Basque fishermen returning from the Americas. We spent um, a week in uh, the uh, Picos de Europa Park um, doing a small group guided tour with a woman, a British woman named Teresa Farina, who's lived in the area for 25 years. So she was um, an excellent guide. She was very knowledgeable of the area, uh, spoke you know, perfect Spanish, but was able to give us a great guided tour in, in English, put on spectacular meals for us every lunchtime. She had packed from the van the beautiful tables and napkins and um, beautiful local cheeses. And it was really quite an extraordinary experience to be out hiking and then have this lovely uh, luncheon. So here you can see some of the beautiful scenery. And again, this is another area where the transhumance, the, the movement of seasonal movement of flocks from low to high pastures has been really important in uh, maintaining these open areas where the orchids and other wildflowers flourish high in the mountains. Um, and we went with uh, Teresa because we had a bus and were there for a week. She took us to many different locations from uh, some really high alpine areas where we, we took a, a gondola up um, to some you know, lower meadows and hillsides, but it was all a very beautiful and uh, spectacular area with uh, wonderful orchids and many other wildflowers, many different varieties of broom, like you see here, pinks, um, really just a, a wonderful, wonderful, uh, botanically rich area. So the next um, slide that you're going to see is another flower in the bee orchid group. And I was really kind of excited when I saw a picture of this plant in the original brochure. And it's called the sawfly orchid. And I'd read about the bee orchid and how the bee orchid had evolved to attract, to look similar to to attract bees. And I saw this picture of the sawfly orchid and I thought, oh my goodness, imagine what the sawfly must look like. You know, if this, this flower is mimicking the sawfly orchid. So we were lucky enough, we did see many beautiful sawfly orchids in the Picos de Europa. And uh, when I got home, I looked up the sawfly and uh, was very disappointed to discover this was about one of the showiest sawflies that I was able to find. So um, kind of doesn't really seem, again, like the name of this orchid really uh, <coughs> applies. As far as I know, it is in fact not uh, pollinated by sawflies. And it certainly doesn't, to me, look very much like one. So another um, beautiful orchid in the, the bee orchid group is um, the woodcock orchid. Um, again, look at the elaborate um, development of different textures, colors, patterns. This is another one that would make a good toy. It makes me think of one of those Russian matryoshka dolls with its kind of narrow, narrow shape there um, and um, beautiful markings and, and textures. 
And again, like the uh, all the others in the uh, Ophris family, um, a, a deceiver offering no nectar um, or um, edible pollen for the insects, but um, attracting them by uh, scent and the pseudo promise of a sex that hopefully maybe it's satisfying sex for them, even though they don't get any. Uh, um, who knows? Anyway, this is another um, two more um, in the bee orchid group, the somber bee orchid here, and then the fly orchid here. And um, again, um, beautiful, interesting, complex flowers. And the fly orchid does look like it can, you can see with this kind of antenna and the wings and the shine that it could need maybe in some uh, cases actually look like a fly. So from here, we uh, go back to uh, another one in the um, uh, food de deception group of orchids, the Anacamptus orchids. In this case, the beautiful pyramidal orchid. Um, and um, this is a, a fragrant orchid with, with uh, showy, um, beautiful, dense uh, clusters of flowers. Um, they, um, Orchids in this group occur in, on grasslands, limestone or chalk deposits, or even on dunes in Eurasia from the Mediterranean region to Central Asia. Um, the pyramidal orchid attracts a large number of both butterflies and moths. Um, but unlike butterfly and fragrant orchids, pyramidal orchids produce no free nectar. So the, the shape of the flower is such that the proboscis of the moth is guided straight into the spur at the back of the orchid. You can't really see the spur very well here. Um, and the pollinia are firmly cemented in space with a viscid matter. Um, so since they produce no nectar, it's not clear why these insects are so persistent in visiting uh, the orchid. And here we have a lovely um, drawing from Charles Darwin of a moth head with pollinia from the pyramidal orchid. Um, seven pairs of pollinia attached to the proboscis. The proboscis is the tongue of this orchid. So here's, a, here's its, this poor um, moth that went to get, a, to get a nice drink of nectar, stuck his tongue in there, and obviously was fooled multiple times because each flower only has one pair of pollinia, and this poor moth has seven pairs of pollinia stuck to its tongue and didn't even get any nectar as a reward. Kind of a rotten deal. Now this is the next um, couple of slides are what I call the honest orchids. They're a, a minority in this, um, in this uh, show tonight anyways. Um, so these are orchids that actually do produce nectar. So they're generally pollinated by butterflies and moths. The, the um, black vanilla orchid here is a, a really lovely um, rich um, red color. And um, I'm not sure how many insects, I know they say bees can't see red. Um, so what I guess it must make a dark contrast that the moths and butterflies are able to see. Um, and then the next um, orchids here, these are more of the, the honest orchids, fragrant orchids, the lesser butterfly orchids. Um, you can see the very long spurs in these, in these orchids crossing back here, um, curving down here, curving way down here. Um, And um, so these are, again, more of the honest orchids, um, heavily scented long spurred flowers, which produce copious amounts of nectar and are mostly pollinated by moths. And like in the previous picture, when the moss inserts its proboscis into the spur to drink the nectar, the pollinia gets stuck to it. So the next orchid is, um, um, a, a next few are kind of, are, is, is a kind of an oddball. 
This is the lizard or goat orchid. I kind of think looking at it makes me think of the Aladdin's genie with kind of the, the turban hat and the long uh, twisty uh, body and the little arms here. Um, and they were um, the tallest orchid we saw. I think they were probably at least um, three feet tall. Some of them maybe even a little bit taller. Um, and um, it grows in roadsides and meadows. Um, they also practice uh, food deception. They have a, uh, are scented. They have a spur, which we can't really see very well. Oh yeah, there you can see it back there, curving back there. There's a spur, but they have no nectar. And although they're not showy to us, it's possible that the purple nectar guides on the white might look different to bees. So it might actually be quite a dramatically uh, uh, showy effect to attract bees. And these four orchids were again back to cheats with showy varied flowers, but no nectar. Um, the green winged orchid um, and the um, heath spotted orchid and the beautiful pink butterfly orchid um, and the early marsh orchid. So you can see the, the variety of this one is really kind of an unusual uh, shape uh, compared with the other ones, much kind of wilder and more roughly. Um, the beautiful heath spotted orchid with its uh, tucked in the grass with its spotted leaves. And another marsh orchid, the early marsh orchid growing along the sides of this uh, wet meadow here. And um, now we come to an orchid that is um, uh, the frog orchid. Um, the frog orchid is quite pretty to me in a discreet way and certainly not particularly frog-like, although it is uh, greenish. Um, it um, is thought to offer a, a food reward as a pollination technique. It has uh, possible nectar secreted early in the morning to allow it to be selectively pollinated by beetles, gnats, and mosquitoes. It likes wet places. And this is one of the a few orchid species that is actually found in Canada, as well as in Spain and other parts of Europe. Um, this is another one of my um, favorites, the, the burnt orchid. I just think it's such, such a beautiful contrast with the dark um, burgundy purple tops and the <clears throat> The white um, spotted little little dresses, they kind of look like little girls in pinafores to me. It's another cheat uh, food deception, no nectar. Pollinators poorly known for this species, but it is known to readily self-pollinate. Um, so despite being so showy and everything, it actually doesn't need to attract any insects. Um, this is the man orchid, and you can see why it kind of, to me, looks more like kind of a, it's maybe a, we've got a motorcycle helmet on or something. Um, uh, but anyway, another interesting orchid and in sort of green with a little bit of red trim. And uh, another one with uh, no, no nectar found, so practicing food deception. This one's not self-pollinating. And it, in fact, is pollinated by sawflies and beetles. Here we're back to another of the helleborine, like the white one that we that we saw earlier, which um, <coughs> practiced the the food deception with the fake pollen. This little yellow uh, mark on here. I think it actually looks a little bit creepy with these bottom teeth and the the top here. It kind of looks a little kind of fierce to me. Um, to a bee, it apparently looks like a campanula, which offers both pollen and nectar. Um, so I guess you have to be a bee to see the similarities there. Um, here's um, uh, a couple more um, helleborine orchids, uh, Klein's helleborine, 
and the broadleafed helleborine. Now, these are actually another couple of honest orchids, which offer a food rewards. They're fragrant and they offer, offer nectar. They are moth pollinated. And um, the, the, these two here, the uh, broadleafed helleborine is actually, um, was in, has been introduced to North America and is spreading in the wild here, not terribly invasively, but it certainly is spreading. And this picture was actually taken um, along the Coquitlam River Trail uh, some years before we uh, ever saw the, the, the broadleaf calibrine in Europe, we actually saw it here. Um, and it can get to be, oh, uh, maybe two, two and a half feet tall. So a, a fairly tall orchid compared with some of the others. So um, the, the final orchids that we're, we're going to see is, a, is an, an interesting orchid found in the beech forests. So this was a, a relatively high elevation beech forest uh, in the uh, Picos de Eroca Park. Um, and the bird's nest orchid was growing all coming up through these um, beech leaves on this slope. You can see it's kind of a, it's a, this creamy color. And um, like our coral roots, it's a mycoheterotroph. So it doesn't have any um, chlorophyll, no leaves. It's just um, uh, tapping into the mycorrhizal relationship between uh, mushrooms and the um, beech trees. So, and it gets its name because the roots of this orchid are a tangled mass of strings that resembles a bird's nest underground. Um, and uh, it actually does offer um, a food reward. It has fragrant and has, a, and has nectar. So another honest one. And our final orchid, um, also a, a neotia like the, um, like the bird's nest orchid is um, the common tway blade. And um, this is, offers a food reward, nectar. It's pollinated by bees and flies. And indeed you can see a little fly there climbing up. This is, a, you can see the trail of nectar dripping down here. Um, and um, interestingly, this is also a species that is, this very species is native to BC. Um, so you will see uh, Neotia ovata here in BC and I have seen it here. So um, that's the last of our orchids, but um, as this uh, show is those, the orchids and Orobanke, um, I just wanted to do a few um, slides about this other really uh, fascinating complex group of plants. So the orobankies are also called broom rapes. And if you find a lot of time hunting for and photographing, photographing wild orchids in Europe, you're very likely to come across broom rapes as well. In many cases, they share the same habitats as orchids. And at first glance, their appearance can be similar to some orchid species. The flowers are not brightly colored, don't produce much nectar, and most are unscented. Although they are occasionally visited by flies, beetles, ants, and wasps, how most species are pollinated remains a bit of a mystery. Microscopic observations on the development of the flowers suggest that some species might, might self-pollinate um, and not need pollinators at all, but others certainly are insect pollinated. So um, the first one we're seeing here, you can see the, the structure here. Um, you can see how it's a uh, um, parasitic. In this case, this is the ivy broom rape on the host plant of uh, English ivy. Um, and they have the very interesting um, ruffledy flowers. Here you can see them, them coming up through the ivy. So the broom rape names usually are an accurate reflection of the plant, the host plant, because it's pretty easy to tell with them because they're actually physically connected to the host plant. So this again, this is the ivy broom rape, lovely kind of ruffled um, yellow flowers with the uh, red uh, accents, very beautiful. 
uh, these are all the slender broom rape, um, uh, which I, I say with its, its glossy red puckered lips, it's kind of the, the femme fatale of the family. It's kind of Mick Jaggery kind of a, or, uh, anyway, I think they're, they're, that one particularly, the bottom one is the pretty, pretty, pretty sexy looking, looking flower. Um, it's widespread in, prey, in Spain and parasitic on broom and other legume species. Um, and a, quite a color variation. Uh, this is the common broom rape, but this is a particular subspecies, the, the seaside uh, broom rape. It grows in a wide variety of soils in semi-shade to full sunlight and on many different hosts, though it generally prefers members of pea and aster families. It's unscented and has quite a wide range of colors from red, brown, yellow, brown to purple, usually with dark veins. This extreme variability makes identification on the basis of size, color or host somewhat uncertain. The preferred host for this particular subspecies, which was growing in the, the um, dunes um, west of Bilbao um, is parasitic on uh, sea carrot. So this was actually not within the uh, Picos de Europa Park, but uh, right down by the ocean. Um, but a very beautiful and interesting plant with a little snail tucked into it. This is the bed straw or clove scented broom rape. It's parasitic on gallium species. A range of insects, including bumblebees, wasps, and stilettophiles, have been recorded visiting the flowers and are all likely pollinators. Again, quite a lovely um, kind of a peachy colored flower there. So another species uh, in the Orobanchi family in um, Europe is the Lathraea. And this um, beautiful plant, we were lucky to see these examples here. Um, uh, it purple toothwort, it's called. It prefers the fresh woodlands of valley bottoms, usually near streams, parasitic on poplar, birch, and other deciduous tree roots. The subterranean part, which can weigh several kilograms, is made up of white stems covered with fleshy scales, flowers and fruits during the rise of the sap in the spring, and then disappears from the surface until the following spring. So this photo, which isn't one of ours, it must have been quite a spectacular show covering that, that wide area. But again, a very beautiful and, and unusual um, plant. And um, our um, paint brushes have all uh, been moved into the family Orobanke now. It's so um, this is just a, a little um, snapshot of some of the other lovely flowers that we saw blooming that weren't orchids. So in this case, uh, uh, spring gentian, uh, beautiful fritillaries that we saw in um, the Mer mostly in the Mercantur, but also in Spain. Um, that's a, oh, I've forgotten what that one is. This lovely little alpine um, plant with the fringe flowers is only about maybe four inches tall. Beautiful wild peonies in Spain. Um, beautiful um, iris, uh, narcissus. And uh, this is um, liver hepatica, uh, which was uh, we saw in the American tour in all different color forms, ranging from deep blue to pale pink. So really uh, many lovely non-orchid flowers uh, to be seen at that time of the year in uh, Southern Europe. And just a final uh, shout out to all the uh, people who helped to make our, uh, the presentation and our trip such a success. Um, uh, people we were, where we were in with uh, itinerance trekking in France where we were uh, who provided us with the, the donkey and the accommodation and beautiful meals. In Spain, Sue Etoch and Grazalema, Mick Richardson in uh, Granada, and Teresa Farino, who did the, the week-long tour in the Picos de Europa. Um, additional photos, wonderful uh, photos available through the Saxifraga Foundation, which is uh, free nature image, images of European biodiversity, just a, a wonderful um, resource. 
um, many online sources that I con contacted and went through for, for information on the different uh, pollination strategies and things. And our companions, Lulu the donkey, Sue Etok and Grazalema, Gloucester the mouse, who many of you have met on our hikes here, and Teresa Ferrino in uh, the Picos de Europa. And that's the end of the presentation.